focus on 1 Corinthians this morning, where Jesus asked us to um, share this, this bread and wine as a part of our um, relationship with him and reminding ourselves that he is our Lord and that we're submitting everything to him. And so while I, I'd like to ask the servers to come up that have been identified, if you're one of the communion servers, you can go ahead and make your way forward. Um, there's a lot of different ways of approaching this communion service together. Over the, the centuries, the church has done many different things. At Bridge, we just want to take it seriously as well, but extend the same kind of grace to you that Christ has extended to us. And so we just we want to um, examine our hearts as we do this. If uh, you're in a place of rebellion against Jesus right now, or you just don't want any part of that, then we would ask that you just let these elements go by you. You don't participate. Another good reason to just let them go by is if there's something God's been laying on your heart and you're still just hanging on, you don't want to respond to what he's asking you to do. If you're in a, a place of that temporary rebellion and you know you haven't settled it with the Lord, again, I just ask that you less, let these elements go by you and spend your time pushing into the Lord and letting him guide you back in, into intimacy with him. And then you can participate in this service with us again next month after you've cleared that. The reason why I, I bring this up is because first, first Corinthians um, chapter 11, verse 27 says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body, that's all of us, and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. So you'll need to read the context of 1 Corinthians 11 and the chapters around it if you want to fully understand what we're trying to do here. But um, that's our context. So we're still passing out some of these elements, but... Um, I'd like to um, share a metaphor with you that was really important to me and Jess yesterday as, as we were um, studying. And it just reminds me that I need to make sure that I'm looking to Christ for the Lordship in my life and not trying to do it on my own. I remember a summer in which I said, it is the ocean I need. So I went to the ocean. But the ocean seemed to say, it is not in me. The ocean did not do for me what I thought it would. Then I said, the mountains will rest me, rejuvenate me. And I went to the mountains. And when I woke in the morning, there stood the grand mountain that I had wanted so much to see. But it said, it is not in me. It did not satisfy. Ah, I needed the ocean of God's love and the high mountains of his truth within. It was wisdom that the depths, the ocean said they did not contain and that could not be compared with jewels or gold or precious stones. Jesus Christ is wisdom and our deepest need. Our restlessness within can only be met by the revelation of his eternal friendship and love for us. So while we finish passing out the elements, you can keep your eyes open if you haven't received yet, but you can be praying with me in spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all this beauty around us, the growing gardens and the growing garden of your people, these little children that are among us. So many precious gifts and big responsibilities that come with that. Lord, we want to look to you this morning as we've proclaimed, if we're, if we're taking these elements, we've proclaimed that we want you to be Lord in our life. And so we thank you for the hope that we have in you, the eternal hope that we have a hope of salvation, that by raising from the dead, you've taken care of our sin, and we can know that we have a future and an eternity with you. I also thank you for the, the hope we have in you of righteousness, that because we're following you, you're doing a sanctifying work in our lives, and you're changing us to be more like you, the way you were when you were here on earth, and removing the sin 
and removing the rebellion out of our hearts and uh, making us more like you. We thank you that we have a hope to not continue in the sin patterns of the past, that you're willing to do something new in our lives. And we thank you for that. Also thank you for the hope that we have in you of guidance and direction, that we don't have to make the hard decisions all on our own, that you've placed the Holy Spirit within us and that we can feel your guidance and that we can feel your whispers of go to the left or go to the right. And so we, we have um, supernatural wisdom that, that we would never have on our own. And then you also strengthen perseverance to follow that course, even if, if the, the path ahead is one with, filled with trial and, and turbulence. Lord, thank you that you're with us in all these ways. And as we take these elements, Lord, we recommit to you that we want to be your children and we want to follow you. And we want to yield every single thing in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, um, that you would remove all secret sin and that you would convict us of, of all of our wayward ways and that you'd help us walk in your truth. We want to be a light and a joy to this community that we live in. We want to follow your mission to bring others into your fold. So Lord, please take these things that we put on, on the altar and, uh, and make us like you and cleanse us from all righteousness. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a reading from 1 Corinthians 11 again. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'll hand it back to you, Nate. Kellen. Kids who want to go to Sunday school, you guys are dismissed to do that now. Let's stand together and uh, continue in song. Uh, the line on this course uh, it's from Psalm 46, but um, the last line says, Oh, where else would we go but with the Lord of hosts? And I'm often reminded we just took communion, and it's actually kind of a weird, if you, haven't, if you didn't grow up as a, Christ, a Christian, you know, the bread represents Jesus' body, the juice represents his blood, and that's kind of a weird tradition. And actually, when Jesus first talked about this, um, it caused a lot of, people to stop following him because they're like what are you talking about we're going to eat your body and drink your blood that's crazy um, and Jesus after many disciples left Jesus turned to the 12 and asked them are you going to leave too um, but they said this where else would we go we know you have the words of life and that you're the son of God um, and so it just reminds me of that as we partake in communion together that um, we serve the living Lord um, today. So let's sing together. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. O oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire with us as a shelter with us in the storm you will lead us through the fiercest battle oh where else would we go but with the lord of hosts god of 
shake of fears and rage, we lift your voice to speak. The earth it bows and all the mountains move into the sea. But Lord, you know the hearts of men and still you let them live. Oh God, who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us and And we Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Over else will we go with the Lord of hosts. Roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God is in control. Though the oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God is in control. as a shelter with us in the storm you will lead us through the fiercest battle oh where else would we go with the lord of hosts lord of hosts you're with us with us in the fire with us as a shelter with us in the Help us grasp the heights 
of your plans for us truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity and by grace will stand on your promises and by faith will walk as you walk with us speak O lord till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory speak O lord till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory father that's our prayer this morning that your church would be built and that the earth would be filled with your glory i pray as we come to your word your spirit would um, open our hearts that we would not just be hearers of your word but that we would be doers enabled by your grace to follow after you in every aspect of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Thanks, team, for leading us in song. So it seems like there's a few more dads here in the second service. First service, I think we, the, those of you that were dancing had burned up some serious calories and maybe need to sleep in a little longer. I have not had that kind of aerobic activity in a long time, that daddy-daughter dance. Well, yeah, nor have I done the hokey pokey in a long time. So <laughs> Super fun spending yesterday, last night with uh, some of you dads and your daughters. Thanks for being a part of that and for all the helping hands that pulled that off. It's good to be here this morning with you, too on a beautiful spring day. Um, speaking of springtime, uh, not only is the sun shining and the grass is green and flowers are blooming, but in the Brower household, springtime is uh, indicative of a very important sort of calendar event. Rivers start flowing <laughs> at high levels. And as with any good um, image, metaphor, analogy in scripture, it always comes back to a river. And so I don't hesitate to remind you of something that I often speak of. And it's one of those fundamentals that I think is critical in understanding Scripture and understanding God's Word, uh, what it, how it pertains to us, who God is, and all that. And it's this. You've heard me say this before. But all of our thinking and right thought has to begin over here, like a river, like a stream, the gospel stream, with who is God, right? And then we move into who are we. And only then can we begin to discuss what has he done to reconcile the two so that we then ultimately might know how we are to live. That's the gospel stream. Who is God? Who are we? How has he reconciled the two? And now how are we to live? And it's critical because oftentimes what we want to do as Christians is plop down right here and say, how are we supposed to live? Uh-uh. We don't go upstream. That's, that's moralism. We start first with the character of God and our our need for him and what the profound thing that he has done for us and then we can know how we are to live and that plays uh, critically into today, today's passage and so that's why I wanted to start there but before we move any further let's pray one more time please father in heaven we thank you for the gift of this day for the sunshine as we mentioned for song for fellowship for the opportunity to gather in safety and enjoy on this new sabbath day thanks for um, all that you have given us, and we come before you today asking that in your mercy you would speak to us, fill this place with your spirit, and uh, use your words to change us and to make us into the men and women you would have us be. We pray it all in Christ's name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Philippians. We are continuing our, our sermon series through there. We're in the second chapter. Um, I wanted to start, begin, just by giving a little bit of context to this section um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up a couple verses in the midst of where Jeff left off last week, and I want to read through, um, read through this section that we're going to talk about to get its entirety, and then we'll go back and highlight a couple things. So uh, let's, second, second, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 3, says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There it is. Powerful passage, one of the most theologically loaded, I would argue, in all of Scripture, uh, particularly pertaining to that gospel stream I was mentioning, okay? And it's all there, and we're going we're gonna to parse this a little bit this morning to, to walk away with that understanding. So our Scripture for today, my, my section, if you will, that I want to just take us to, begins in verse 5 with the verse that just says, as we plop down in them, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that's where it begins. Have this mind among yourselves. Which mind? Well, this one. The one that we just talked about and the one that is about to be explained yet again. Did you catch it? So this mind, this attitude, the one that sees others more important than yourself. The, The same mind that doesn't look upon your interests only, but the interests of others. Have that kind of mind in you. That's the one we're looking for. The, literally the mind of Christ, how Christ, and we're going to, Paul's going to s- spell that out of what it means exactly. But there's a couple of things that I think when you, when you uh, enter into texts that are like this, that are kind of, um, well, they're pretty rich, they're robust, you know, there's a lot going on. And a good Bible study skill is simply as you're ruminating on these things is to, to take a glance at another translation and see what it has to say. See how it parses the, uh, the language and you might be You might be enlightened a little bit. So I wanted to do that with this verse just for a second with you. So 2 Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, I'm reading from the ESV, and it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. King James Version says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, this mind needs to be in you. And it, it is actually the mind that was in Christ as well. And some of us in here really like to read from the net, and I really like how the net says, you should have the same attitude towards one another that Christ Jesus had. That one kind of goes to the jugular, doesn't it? The same attitude, the same perspective, the same view that Christ had, have that. There you go, if that's not convicting. And it ought to be at some level, right? Because we all know that our attitudes aren't exactly oftentimes that of Christ, right? We're selfish people. Myself included. And we have our attitudes. We have our rights and privileges that are obstructed or violated. And so therefore, my attitude isn't like Christ, as we'll see spelled out here. But here, that's the exhortation that Paul says. Hey, have this mind amongst you. How did Jesus view people? Go do that. But he continues on. Again, just... Staying with verse 5 is repetition here. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Here's another, I don't know if you caught it when I read the whole context, but here's another um, skill that ought to be ingrained in you. Whenever you're reading scripture, look for the words that are repeated. And I don't know if you caught it when I read the whole context, but there's a word here repeated in these two verses and in the next one, three times. You see it twice here because I don't have the, I don't have verse eight up right now. It's form. You see that? This is important. Okay. This is important in understanding who is God. The first headwaters of our stream, right? We, so don't miss this. Paul says, right here, speaking of Jesus, right, who was in the form of God, didn't account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptying himself and took on the form of a servant. Strategic pause there. I want you to think hard about that. This word form that we get in English 
It's a, it's a tough translation. In the Greek, there's, a, there's various terms, but they're both two specifically that are both translated form, which, as you know, the languages are, are tough because they'll translate ideas, but they don't translate words, right, straight across. We can get the ideas, but there are words that mean different things. And I'm emphasizing this because this is critical. If you read it at first glance, it can fall on your ears in such a way that it's, so though he, was, though he was in the form God, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Some of you might even be thinking, well, it sounds a little bit like Jesus didn't really understand equality with God. Like he didn't grasp who he was with God. He didn't, he didn't fully understand. That's not what it's saying at all. Okay, erase that. That is not a right interpretation. Uh, the term form as it appears here in verse 6 and 7. There's a, the Greek word is morphe. Some of you know this. Right? Morphe. It's translated form. And morphe is very different than the other translation, which I'll give you in a minute. But, but morphe, at its essence, it literally means, it's, it's the thing about someone that never actually does change. When you talk about the form or the morphe of something, that's the, that's the essence, okay? That's the actual identity of something. When you walked in these doors this morning, you came and you sat down, you're the same person in essence, your identity, right now as when you were when you walked in. You're the same person, your identity, again, your essence, intrinsically who you are as you were 10 years ago. But you, your, your form has changed substantially. Even in the few moments of when we first started this service, you have lost cells. You've sloughed them. Like, your body is changing. You're aging. That's a different kind of form. Is this making sense? Your morphe stays the same. And here, this is critical because it's saying very specifically, Jesus, who though he was in fact in the form, the morphe, God, his divine nature, fully God, uncompromised, the more, his essence, not just his purposes, not just his sort of like goals or objectives. No, his essence is fully God. And it says here in the ESV, was not something to be grasped. Again, kind of a, a struggle to know what does that mean. I really actually like the NIV's take on this, where NIV says this. Uh, this is how it's translated. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. He wasn't grasping to understand it. He says, no, I'm actually, the literal translation is, I'm going to set that aside. He let go of that. He wasn't something, his prerogatives that he had, he understood those, and he set them aside. He didn't cling fast to those things. Jesus was fully, divinely God, and he took his privileges, he took his prerogatives, he took his divinity, and he said, I'm not going to hold on to that. I'm going to set that aside because I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to take on the form of a servant. He's about to do something. How does he do it? Well, if you caught it in the scripture, in the text there, it says in verse 7, he emptied himself, laid aside his privileges to do something that a servant would do. And he took on the form or the likeness of man. Now, here's an interesting thing about this. This text says of Jesus, right? Though he was equal to God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But a little bit of a history lesson. Isn't it interesting that we, on the other hand, though we are not equal to God, consider equality with God something to be grasped. That's exactly what Adam did way back in the garden. Not equal to God. Yet, I'm going to grasp for it. Who is God? He is the divine one. He's the creator, separate and distinct from us. Who are we? Not that, but we think we are. Still today, right? It's still the struggle. Every time that we choose sin over God, we are communicating to him, I think I can do this better than you. I think I'm God. Over self. Even if it be just over self. I'm going to do it my way because I think I can do a better job of that and how wrong we are, right? And God knows this, and so what does he do? He responds to it. He doesn't just throw his hands up and say, well, whatever, I'm done with you. No, he actually 
moves towards the conflict, humbles himself, sets aside his godness, takes upon himself the identity of a slave, and listen to what it says in verse 8. Being found in human form, there it is again for the third time, right? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There's the second word for form. The first one is morphe, right? Identity, essence. This word, form, as it arrives here, is schema. Totally different word. It's purely an external appearance. It deals with visibilities. You see what's happening here? This is one of the most glorious pictures of the divinity of Christ and what he did at the incarnation. Fully God, he sets aside those privileges and he assumes upon himself the flesh and appearance of man in humility. I would never do that for any one of you. Nor would you do it for me, right? If you're the king of the universe, you're actually going to clothe yourself in flesh, humble yourself, and come die for those rebels who sinned against you? Uh Uh-uh. We don't have it in us, do we? But Jesus does. I realize this is kind of a shallow image or picture or metaphor or whatever you want to call it. But I, I, as I've thought about this over and over again, there's this, there's this um, story that comes to mind. And some of you, I've, I've shared with you, I think my first real sort of job, kind of like where I actually had to apply to the interview and all that stuff. And I, was, I was 15 or 16, and my best friend at the time, his grandma, her name was Flo, <laughs> Sounds like I'm making this up. It's great. I often thought I should write this in a story, and I think I've referenced it before. But his grandma's Flo, she was like 75 years old, and at the time I would have swore she was 100. Because she was, you know, I'm 15, and she's the manager, the cleaning manager of a hotel. And she hires this group, my best friend and I, of which were two, to be maids. So there you go. Kirk Brower's first real job, I was a maid for a lady named Flo at a hotel in Boise, right? And one of the best things I... (laughs) One of the best things is when you would open up a room to go in and clean it, and they had checked out, and there's a half-eaten pizza right there. You're like, we won the lottery. And my, it's, uh, I've grown up a lot since then. But here's the funny part. I, the, here's, the, here's the Philippians part. I distinctly remember, this was back in the day before we had, like, the cards, you know, that you would, we actually had keys in the hotel. We had keys. And you had a, there was a cup on the cleaning cart that we would park in the hallway, and we had a list of all those who were checkouts. And those were our priority. First, we wanted to go in and get those clean. And we had a cup with the keys in that cup that corresponded to each room. And we would have to find the key that corresponded to the room and knock. We knew they had checked out so we could go in. Flo knew better than to give two teenage boys the key that went into the other cup. That was the master key. She kept that key in her pocket, and when she had to run or do something and knew it was going to take it, she would put that key in the master cup, and it accessed every door in that hotel room. That's a little bit, a real shallow attempt to explain what happened. God, in Jesus, has the master key and all authority and everything. You know what he did with that key? He put it in the cup, and he set it aside. His privileges, his rights, and his power... And he took upon himself, in humility, man. And then he bore sin, withholding himself from all the rights and privileges that he actually had for you. Great humility to become a servant. But he never, ever compromised his divinity. His morphe was there the whole time, but his schema had shifted. He took upon himself the image, the picture, the visibleness of a man. And listen to this all the way. Don't miss this. All the way. Not just to come walk among us, but all the way to the cross. Did you hear that? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And not just any death. Death on a cross. The most horrific way of torture you could ever imagine. And he endured that and he scorned its shame demonstrating an attitude of servanthood and humbleness, right? So in in 1 Peter, I was talking with a friend this week, and I was reminded yet again of a similar passage, almost a sister passage to this. I don't have a slide, so forgive me, but I'll read it to you. Why did he do all this? Well, I think 1 Peter and Philippians go hand in hand, and they explain, at least in part, why he did this. 1 Peter 2, 21 
through 24, I'll read it to you. It says this. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He did this. Did you catch it? Set an example for us. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in Philippians. Christ is our example. You want to know what kind of attitude or mindset to have? Have one like Christ. You want to know how to treat people and engage in service? Do what Christ did. You want to know what to do with conflict and hardship, struggles? Do what Christ did. We go towards it. We move into it with prayer and grace and mercy, forgiveness and restoration. Knowing that sometimes it doesn't go that way, right? Because we're broken people who live amongst the broken people. He's our example. But it doesn't stop right there. Who is God? The divine one. Who are we? The rebels who put him on that cross thinking we were just ones. What has he done to reconcile us? He died for our sins in our place so that we might now become the righteousness of God. And how are we to live because of it? In a similar fashion of humbleness and servanthood. But don't miss this. Listen to how this ends in verses 9 on. Therefore, there's the connector, right? Therefore, because we have this example in Christ, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, cause and effect, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, he's not just our example. He's not just the one whom we ought to emulate. He's also the king that is to be worshipped. That's really critical. Don't miss that. Jesus is not just a great moral teacher. He is not just a good sort of front runner of how we are to live. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And one day every name, every voice, every, every tongue will confess that he is who he is, and every knee will bow, whether you like it or not. And did you catch it? In heaven, on earth, below, everything is going to worship God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, as he is. He demands worship. He calls for it. He deserves it. And he, in fact, is the one of whom we are to emulate because of how he lives. So he's both. And we cannot begin to forget that those two things go hand in hand. So what do we do? How do we get there, right? What's the whole point? This is the beauty of the gospel, that when we come into a relationship and profess Christ, you know what, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul actually says, guess what? When you profess Christ and you receive the forgiveness of sins and the gospel penetrates your heart, as we just rehearsed when we took communion, there's all kinds of wild biblical magic that takes place. Not Harry Potter magic, right? Biblical magic. And one of the things is the Holy Spirit comes to reside within every believer. And he changes us. He removes the heart of stone and he puts in a heart of flesh. And part of that also, according to 1 Corinthians 3, is he gives us a new mind and phones to remind us that we have new minds. There's the, there's the jingle, right? We have a new mind. We have the mind of Christ. Paul literally says that. We actually now have the mind of Christ. And in humility, we're called to honor it, to respond to it. So it plays it out. I've got two thoughts here as you, as you leave this morning. As you go out, you think, what does this matter? What does this have to do with anything? Well, first of all, it begins with simple reflection, right? What does humble submission toward the will of God look like right now in your life? Right now. Like all of us probably have something in our mind, like I know what humble submission looks like. And it's a little uncomfortable, right? Because this is the upside down kingdom, you see? Humble submission. Jesus humbled himself, submitted to the Father, and what happens? He was exalted. Anybody want to be exalted? You must first be humbled. Who inherits the kingdom of God? The meek. That's how the upside down kingdom works, right? And so the first step in this process is just recognizing what does that humble submission look like in my life? Maybe I'm in total rebellion and I've never professed Christ as king. 
Maybe I'm dwelling on some sin or some unresolved conflict in my life and I need to move towards it. Maybe I've got something that I just need to air out first vertically with the Lord and then second horizontally with somebody else that might just so happen to be sitting next to me, right? But second of all, how does knowing what Christ did for you change your attitude and view towards others? This is the hardest thing about the gospel is I don't get to just go on living how I once was. When he infects me with his spirit and permeates every cell of my body and is changing me, my attitude is the hardest part, my mind. That's where every battle, every situation all begins right here in my mind, right? How do I view other people? See, I don't, I, I used to, it was like a playground pickup game of basketball when things didn't go my way. You know what I got to do? Pick up my ball, go home. But not with the gospel. I got to move towards that resolution. I got to move towards that conflict. And even in charity and in love and in kindness and in grace, I don't get to wait for somebody to move towards me. I get to move towards them first because that's what Christ did. It's his love that compels us, not our love that compels us. Those are two very drastically different things. So as you go home today, those are the two things I'd love for you to ponder as you contemplate the reality of, oh, that's who God is, the divine one, deity, the Messiah, the king, and the friend, and I am not. I'm a sinner still in need of this sanctified work in his, of his, the only he can do in my life, and that's what, he's, that's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. He did, he's doing, and he will continue to do, and I ought to live a life that reflects an attitude towards him. So what does it look like today to move in humble submission towards him? And how does knowing what he did for me change my attitude towards you? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you so very much again for the cross, for your son, for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for the privilege of celebrating communion and reflecting on it again this morning. We thank you that we... um, We have a mediator, Jesus, your son, your one and only son, whom you loved, whom you gave on our behalf so that we could, in fact, be reconciled to the king. And Lord, our our prayer this morning is that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to live a life where our attitudes reflect yours. And we ask that at the end of the day, however that manifests itself in our life, that you would, in fact, receive all glory and all honor and praise. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Let's stand and sing a closing song together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by time and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature and manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great is thy faithfulness great is Morning by morning, new mercies I see, and all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for 
your sin and a peace that endureth thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i say and all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me great is thy faithfulness lord unto to me father you truly are faithful all these blessings that we have in christ through faith alone uh, we are so so privileged i pray that this week we would grow in humility that we would um, seek to um, look out for the interests of others and not just our own interests that we would live as servants not to be served but to serve as you did jesus while you were on earth. We thank you for your word and for your spirit that enables us to follow it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.